Tonight's uh, presentation is going to be by Gary Kohler. Um, I think it's the freight operations of the Sandy River and Rangeley Lakes. Okay. And we see you in full screen mode, so all's good. Great. Now, before I get rolling on this, I got to set this up a little bit. <clears throat> One, my plan with it is is to try to make this as interactive as as possible so you know tom sullivan <clears throat> i don't know why i'm picking on you so if, you know if anybody's got questions or something needs to be explained or you have some input whatever please don't um you know i keep coming up with a lot of great ideas on you know how to work like this freight car book that I'm working on to make things better. I can, that's how I came up with this, uh, this freight traffic and traffic patterns and all this other stuff idea. So, you know, please, you know, join in the conversation. I don't want to hear myself talk. Okay. And because of the, uh, how I've had to put this together, I am going to have to jump around a little bit. I can't, it's going to be very difficult to just oh let's just talk about this and then we'll talk about that and then something else so i'm going to be jumping around a little bit but um and the other thing that i wanted to do was kind of approach this uh not just from a strictly historical perspective i i, I tried to approach this from a modeler's perspective and believe me i've been you know working on this and thinking about this pretty much every day for the last several months and you know, how does this relate to us as modelers? How can we use this to do whatever it is we're doing and do it better? And in a conversation, several conversations that, that uh, Jim and I have had recently is, you know, how can, you know, if you don't have a ton of space, because, uh, you know, over the years we've all heard, oh, I can't model the SR and RL, that's way too big. Well, that's, that's kind of ridiculous, but uh, so hopefully I can get into a little bit of that tonight. And at least give you, you know, if you don't have a ton of space, hopefully you'll take some some thoughts away from this that might alleviate that problem. So, however, first thing I want to touch on is I gotta go find it here. <laughs> uh, this targeted subject historical book and. This is kind of important. And again, Jim and I have been talking about this. And in fact, the target of his new book is going to be approaching the Waynesburg and Washington kind of from this perspective. And, you know, being able to look at these railroads in, you know, in a different light than what we're, you know, typically are used to. And what's what's that line you use, Jim? What's that? What do you say? The little. Oh, well, yeah, yeah I, I thought we were going to talk about the Lilliputian engines transporting the hoity-toity, you know, on the SR and RL, the marbles, to vacation at the Rangeley Lake House. Well, Is that what we're talking about here? Yeah, tonight? no, but the some of what we end up, you know, believing that in particular, and yes, that was stage plan. We kind of worked on that a little bit because we typically think of these things in those terms as opposed to what are these really all about and what are they doing? Because, you know, as modelers, I'm guessing the average person really doesn't care. But um, what we do get subjected to is some of what's down here at the bottom and it's misinformation or misidentification. And some of this does, and it turns up in books, even recently published books, and that is just not true. And so pretty much everything that I'm going to talk about is either stuff I can actually physically show you, I have documentation on, or otherwise, this is about as 99% factual as, as I could get it. So with that, we're going to get rolling here. <laughs> this is the earliest uh, freight bill that I happen to have. If there's an earlier... Uh, one floating around out there. I'm not aware of it, but it, as you can see, it's 1881. So this is the first year of operation of the Sandy River. And as you will, if you're reading faster than I'm talking, 
<laughs> they had uh, four barrels of oil, three boxes, and two barrels of sugar, totaling 2,700 pounds. Now, that's a lot of weight. And uh, one of the things that, as I went through all the freight receipts, freight bills, and stuff that I have, and started laying all this stuff out, sugar is a recurring commodity that seems to turn up a lot. And I mean a lot and a lot of weight. 2,700 pounds is not something you're throwing in the, you know, the corner of the baggage car. And it's, it just wasn't baggage. It was actually a, a freight bill. Was, you know, so this was LCL. And we're going to talk about this LCL stuff a little bit more as we, we progress through this. Because uh, this is a big deal on the SR and RL. In fact, most of the northbound freight out of Farmington was probably classified as LCL. And this is, uh, you know, this, whatever the commodity is, was, um, is not something that would be you know, tossed in the, into the corner of the, of the combine. You know, these are, this, this is, come on, like this, you know, you've got more than a ton of material there, and it's probably being put in a box car, and the box car would be going wherever. In this case, it's H.J. Bates and, and Strong, and I'm not quite sure who he was. But I will tell you, and I, I didn't include them all here, but a sugar by the ton turns up many, many other times, just in the in the material that I have. So all the other stuff that's out there that you know that I've never seen, don't have, whatever, I'm I'm be willing to bet that countless thousands of tons of sugar found found its way up to to Franklin County. So I don't know if these people just had a sweet tooth, but anyway, it's. It is a commodity that does turn up quite a bit. And like I said, I'm gonna jump around a little bit. And to uh, help Tom out a little bit, I, I dug this one out. It's from 1888. And what you're, you're reading there is right. There is 501 barrels of flour. And the weight's given there. Uh, so you can clearly see that by my calculations this is about three box car loads this isn't some again this it wasn't coming up in a sack in the back of the of the combine and this was 1888 so you know the 24 foot cars <clears throat> and but <laughs> flour grain and meal are also uh, you know commodity that turns up quite a bit in in countless hundreds of pounds I mean we're not we're talking talking about a can we're talking about barrels and barrels of this stuff yeah <clears throat> this just happened to be the one that it you know 18,000 pounds there I thought it was was pretty impressive is that going to dryer oh that's but, the agent that is the agent is that the same Bates as before, Gary, in Strong? Yes. Okay, so it's going to Bates. So he's he's a dealer of something. <clears throat> Correct. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> I'm assuming you can see both of these. Yeah. Yes. Hey, Gary. You should be able to find out who Bates is by looking in one of those uh, old main directories, the old phone books. You could look up the person by their town, and it listed their their business or occupation. You just need to know. You just need one from the right year or years. Just saying. Hey, hey, Chris, not and Gary, not to derail you, but I've been doing the same thing with the W and W. And there is a publication out there called the American Agriculturalist. And I have found it's what's called a farm directory from the early 1900s. Uh, I got Washington County, Pennsylvania from 1915, and I got Greene County from 1916. And it'll list general stores, farmers, uh, oil dealers, oil drillers. Uh, Basically, as you just said, it's a it's a who's who of businessmen in those respective counties, and um, 
I can send out the link to the one to Washington County. I'll send it to David and you guys can back into like Maine if you want to look at it. But it, it's, it's, it was a, it's a fascinating book and it goes town by town by town by town in that county. Okay. Perfect. We just need to find one for Franklin County. I'll look it up while we're talking here. Anyway, I included <laughs> these two. Uh, what you're seeing there is all from the same. Uh, there's actually four receipts that are glued together. I couldn't, the glue's on over a, whatever, 130 years old, and I couldn't get it apart. But anyways, there's, there's four different receipts here. And I picked this one primarily because I want to show that it, this was originally shipped from the Portland Steam Packet Company. And, you know, looking at how some of this material actually found its way, you know, to one of the railroads in Franklin County, you know, it was kind of, kind of interesting. Now, obviously, the Portland Steam Packet Company probably doesn't mean a bill of beans to any of us modeling the SRNRL, but I found it fascinating, and Neil and Quimby happens to be one of the largest, were one of the largest, uh, whatever, dry goods operations in Rangeley, and there is countless thousands of, you know, freight receipts that have apparently were found up in their attic over the years, but this just happened to be one that I, I thought was a little more interesting. I'm not sure what was in the case, but so we're back to the uh, sugar again. So <clears throat> and there's about a ton of it. And again, it's just it's something that keeps you know turning up over and over and over and over again. And you know, so again, I got to jump around here a little bit. So as this material is coming into Farmington and how the main central got it there, I really don't know. I can't answer that. Um, I, there's probably a main central uh, freight receipt that's attached to this somewhere along the line, but that big freight shed that's in Farmington uh, was there for a reason. and you know, putting all this together, and I you know, was thinking about the freight shed situation, um, you know, because I've never, I never put a lot of thought into it over the years. And then, you know, looking at this stuff, it starts to make more sense. This material comes in there is about a thousand, two, a ton of, as far as I know, that's all sugar. It's not whatever it's all sugar so there's a ton of it so it would be you know probably come in there be moved into the freight house and then would later be you know transferred to a narrow gauge box car and you know when it would go up the line to whatever this guy's name is something Allen and so the question that I have for everybody is We'll see how many people come up with an answer. How many major stations along the SR and RL had separate freight houses? No, nothing. Two. Nobody. Nobody. Two or one. Phillips. Maybe half. Oh. This is kind of important stuff. Come on. Strong. Yeah. Madrid might have had one. Farmington, Carabasset, Bigelow. Yeah, Carabasset, Bigelow, King Kingfield didn't. Rangeley. Strong. All right. The 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 two most noticeable are Strong and Phillips. Their right. freight sheds were basically identical. For whatever reason, Kingfield never had a separate freight shed, which seems odd, but if 
there is any information out there that Kingfield ever had a separate freight shed, I'm not aware of. So uh, the freight shed at Carabasset was attached to the station at some point. And then uh, when the, they had to put the Y in for the plywood mill, it was, was shortened and moved across the track. Bigelow actually had several freight houses. It had two. Please. And on the other side, uh, Madrid Junction did not, but Madrid, the town of Madrid apparently only had a small freight house. There was a separate freight house warehouse in Reddington. And at one time there was uh, definitely one at Dead River and Rangeley never had a separate freight house. The new station had a long freight shed attached to the station and we'll get the pictures of that later. But so all these freight houses uh, clearly paid, played a role in you know, going back to what I said earlier about LCL. Most of the material coming in, inbound, was all LCL. So whatever it was, whether it's a ton of sugar or several tons of whatever, was probably going to one of these uh, freight houses. So again, there's a reason to go you know, park, park your box cars in, in front of these freight sheds and actually have a purpose instead of just, oh, geez, I'll park a box car there because it looks cool. So, but there were plenty of them. <laughs> these might be a little hard to read. Um, and I can blow them up if I, if you need to, but. I can blow, blow them up there. And if you, this is, uh, I've got three freight receipts at, from Carabasso, which are pretty unusual. There's not many of these things in, in existence. But if you will notice on the left side of the page here, it says local. And that's, um, this local thing's gonna come up a little later in the conversation. And, and we'll get to that when the time's right. And it was a truckload of slats being delivered there. And obviously at 10,000 pounds, you know, whatever it was, was quite a bit of it. This one, I use, I, I use this one specifically to show that Carabasset was also a destination point for deliveries outside of the county. And in this case, it is taking a delivery from the Stratton Manufacturing Company. I happen to find this one particularly of particular interest because it was, they were delivering shovel handles to a company in Cleveland, which that isn't necessarily my backyard, but it's only about an hour and a half from here. So it is in my backyard. And so I, uh, I, there's a kind of a connection there that I thought was kind of intriguing. But there were manufacturers and, and mills and such in Stratton that were obviously, you know, transporting material down to Carabas and being loaded on the train and, and shipped out of there. So I personally found that pretty fascinating. I think it's interesting that they're, the, the, what do you need to build a shovel is you got some sort of blade and maybe an end handle and you put in a piece of wood. So they manufacture the wood part, pay somebody and then have it shipped across country to be made into the final product, which has probably got to be delivered, you know, highly in use in the Midwest, but still. Well, it's just, you know, <laughs> it brings things like, you no, know, this is kind of real. It's, I, I don't, I think we as modelers have this tendency to not look at our railroads or our models like that. Because, you know, I mean, let's face it, I think most of you, you know, we like playing with trains. So we kind of look past some of that stuff. But for those of you guys, and I won't exclude you, Dave, that have large layouts. The stuff becomes more important. Now, the uh, so I'm kind of almost done with the freight bill 
thing. But I do have one one more that we we'll talk about this a little bit. I'll get this blown up so we can see it. <laughs> dates on these freight bills? Yeah. This one's 1934. There's three SRNRL cars to 228, 246, 330. And this is this, these local, uh, I'm going to get to that and I'll show you a more clear example of what that's all about. And, but this is, it, those three cars only filled one standard gauge car, as you can see here, with 40,000 pounds of poplar bolts. That's not pulp wood. Huh. So that's, that's turning wood for something. So there's a big difference. Pulp wood is pulp wood. Hardwood is hardwood, and poplar is considered all of them. So, in the for those of you that have the conductor's book, you can go and you know reference this stuff, you know, whenever. But for those that don't, um, <coughs> I took this material out of the out of the conductor's book. I wish I had about twenty of these things. But in the in the book, uh, and you can. Kind of read down there. Pulp wood is these aren't the number of trains or per cars. This is the number of times it was noted in the book over a three month period of time for you know a particular crew or whatever the case was. So there was you know the pulp wood is obviously the most of 38 entries, hardwood logs, sawn lumber, railroad ties. That's another thing. How many of you guys have cars with railroad ties on? There's a great photo in uh, Peter Cornwall's book of rack car 240 is strong filled with railroad ties. And that, that's a spectacular photo. There. So uh, grain and notes, uh, Birch Stock Bell Manufacturing Company. This is one of the few times that I've seen in a situation like this where a company was specifically targeted, you know, using its name as having something delivered there. Uh, sand, soft and hard coal, uh, you know, destinations laid out in the book. Phillips Local, Rangeley Local. Uh, at the time, you know, when I first started going through the conductor's book, none of that made any sense to me. In fact, I, I, I freely admit, I had to go look up what exactly did they mean by low what does that mean railroad lingo uh, what what does local mean and um, well the sr and rl did that a lot and this goes back to what i was saying a little earlier about you don't need uh, you know four thousand square feet of space to model the sr and rl um because it's pretty clear to me they were moving a lot of material from whether it's kingfield to phillips phillips to somewhere else Reddington to Strong, uh, you know, these these were all lo what they called locals and they were online deliveries. This was not material that was going down to Farmington to be transshipped someplace else. And, <coughs> sorry, I have a cold. And everybody- I mean, I think that makes sense. There's a lot of industry that's based on things either pulled out of the woods or some piece made in some other turning mill going to something else. Um, even some of the fruit and stuff that might have been. I think that makes sense. And and it is what makes one of the interesting things. It's not just a lumber conveyor belt of pulp wood. Correct. So the um, this last freight receipt. That I'm going to show you guys. I, I picked this specifically. I, you know, at the time I, 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 I hadn't, wasn't real sure of what I even had, you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, or whenever I got the thing. But 
the well, I'm going to deal with the top one first. And one of the things that rarely ever shows up in photographs is any kind of machinery sitting on a, any kind of flat car on the SR and RL. And I can I can only think of three photos that actually show something, whether it's a, a mill boiler or something. But there's only about three cases of where I can point to a photograph that shows something like this. In this case, it happens to be an, a, a mill engine. It weighs 8,000 pounds, so this isn't something that they, you know, they picked up down at the local hardware store and threw in the back of their, you know, Model T. So, thought that was pretty interesting. The other freight receipt is actually a real piece of documentation of a local delivery. Uh, I didn't show you, uh, you know, I didn't put the other part of the, the freight receipt in there, but you're just going to have to believe me. <laughs> so this was generated online and delivered online. And uh, thankfully, uh, it does have a date and it also supplies the car numbers, which I which was really fascinating to me. Um, it happens to be useless railroad uh, 211 and PNR2. Uh, for those of you guys that follow, you know, the rolling stock, e even in the slightest, there's very, very little documentation on PNR car numbers. Very little. I don't care what's been published. But in this case, it happens to be uh, two car loads of lumber and uh, to the tune of 30,000 pounds. And, you know, so I thought this was very fascinating uh, that, you know, it is proof positive of a quote unquote local delivery. And when we get into the, uh, you know, the, the, the timetable, train schedule, train orders and all that stuff here in a second, then, you know, this stuff would maybe make a little bit more sense. Any questions? Thoughts? What's the, what's the WB stand for? Next to the car numbers, what's WB date and WB number? What, right here? Yeah. Printed it, printed on the form. I, I don't know. <clears throat> Waybill. I think it says Waybill date, Waybill number. Okay. Yeah, so it says WB date. 516 or something like that, May 16th, because the final date is actually May 17th, but maybe there was something about it was created and WB number two, you know, probably just the which one of that day. So they keep track of it, give it a un unique number. Well, I can't, I can't show you the. I'm sharing the screen, but anyway. Hey, Gary. <laughs> yes. Just help help me on the, the one at the bottom. So <clears throat> it's from Bigelow, May 17th? Yeah, this is from the Prouty and Miller Mill. Okay. Prouty, oh, okay, right. Okay, Prouty and Miller. And it's going where? Somewhere on the PR. Okay. Yep. Which is kind of unique. <laughs> well, it's kind of unique in that. No, oh, well, well, and it says from Phillips on the right to from Phillips. So I don't know. I don't know how to read them. Gary, I can't. Uh, I don't have an explanation for how they documented some of this stuff. Gary, uh, lumber equals saw lumber, lumber equals saw logs. Basically, uh, is it finished lumber or is it raw logs? It just says two cars of lumber. We, okay. We don't know how to interpret that more than it's wood. Well, if it's coming, if it's coming from Prouty and Miller, it's sawn, isn't it? That would be my guess. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> that's my as, assumption as an aside dave i note australian english does not translate without some help into american english 
<laughs> well, we'll save that for another Zoom. <laughs> all, all good, Gavin. I often wonder that term myself when I see things like lumber on things in Sandy River notation. Hey, Gary. Yeah. Um, so looking at that same bill, if it's the Eustis Railroad, and I'm not familiar with their rolling stock, Eustis Railroad car 211, what would that be? Is it a flat or is it? Go ahead. A flat car. Okay. And the Phillips and Rangeley is a flat number two? Well. And didn't the uh, Eustis flat cars, weren't they the ones with the large steak pockets? Yes. That is correct, Christopher. Yeah, there's very few photos that show lettering on pre-consolidation freight cars. Specifically PNR and Eustis. Yeah. Well, there are a few of Eustis, very few of the PNR. Yeah, I'm thinking of the photos of the uh, construction train on one of the branches. It's a shot from down below the grade looking up and the lettering is really clean on the flat cars and their cars are gravel. Keep talking. <laughs> was, uh, I'm looking for something. Was the freight agent essentially the, uh, the depot agent at every station? Say that again. Was the freight agent, was there one at every station? Was it essentially the station master? Well, see, that's a good question and it depends on what year. Because <laughs> at the end, only a handful of stations still had a station agent. And I'm guessing uh, most of them were probably gone by the early 30s. But yeah, and wasn't, wasn't there a position in Phillips that was like almost like a freight car master that had a, a ledger with every where every car was, where it was going, where it had been, et cetera? And that guy was in charge of all the cars for the road? Uh, there were, they had a road master. Where did you hear about that, Chris? I don't remember now, but I'm not talking about a road master. I think a road master is in charge of maintaining the grade. I'm talking about an uh, actual guy in charge of all the cars in a ledger book. I believe in Phillips. Can't remember where I read that. Keep talking. We're listening. I guess they wrote the number in at the top right corner of them. The uh, top one says 159. The lower one says 169. Probably easier to write it in and print them separately. That's a number uh, on the form. That's not the car numbers. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. It's like a... a, a ticket number yeah that's probably you know the one from bigelow for instance that might be the 169th of the year or something like that you know right because that's how they had to do, keep track of all this stuff they had copies and would keep them in numerical order is my guess you know there, there's a lot of history of that you, you see it for other things in railroads such as dispatching and train orders and that kind of stuff. Everything has a number. Plus, David, it's all on paper. We think of everything today in digital perspective, but like Gary and I talked about the other day when the uh, the goods came in from on the steam packet. So there was paperwork that had to be on the boat, and there's paperwork at the dock, and there's paperwork on the railroad to get it to Maine. So there's all of this paper trail that had to match up 
uh, yep. consistently to get the, the good to its destination. You know, today we punch things on a computer and we can find out where our Amazon order is within seconds. Back then it was all paperwork that had to be absolutely spotless and accurate. That's what amazes me. Wait a second. Yeah. They didn't have that was that. right into our childhood too. Right, Jim? Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I'm just thinking about that people, today. A lot of people you know, when, do those jobs. Yeah, when I was, you know, uh, first ordering uh, model kits and stuff, you would fill out an order form. You would hand write order form, go to the post office and get a, a money order, put it in your handwritten order form, and wait a couple of weeks for it to show up. <laughs> Didn't have the internet, at, you know, eBay for instant ordering. So yeah, we, we kind of experienced that early in our, our lives, like you said. Not to get all stupid and nostalgic, but I remember going to the bank with my parents in the like late seventies, whatever, and there would be like twenty tellers. Oh yeah. And there would be a huge desk with about a million forms. Yeah. And there would be lines at half of those twenty tellers or more. Yep. Uh, oh, yeah. during lunchtime. It was crazy. Yep. Yep. Today, Chris, it's all online banking and ATM transactions. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I work for a major bank, so I know, I know what, what you're talking about, Chris. You know, we, we highly encourage using our online application. Try not to come in and actually engage a teller that's the last thing we want you to do heck no we want that <laughs> oh and heaven that, forbid heaven, heaven forbid, forbid. <laughs> face to face contact <laughs> oh. exactly <laughs> heaven forbid what are you looking for well i already i found it but i i have to digress because you've been talking about all this this nostalgic crap okay so, so now i i know i've told a couple of you guys this story but Way back when, I think I was still, still at home, still living at home. And I used to order photos from the Beverly Historical Society. And, you know, back when you had to order stuff through the mail. Yeah, that's what we were talking about. Yep. Yeah, yeah, everybody went dead silent because nobody remembers that. <laughs> but, but hey, I, I had a time because you could only order like so many pictures at a time within a certain amount of time, but I figured it all out and I had it down to the day where I could get my next order in the mail while the next one was in transit. So anyway, okay. Sorry, I thought it was funny. Oh, it is. Did you figure it out at that age that you could do that? That's great. <laughs> yeah, anyway, the question was, that's not funny. That's tenacity. That's two foot tenacity right there. You know, <laughs> I needed new stuff. I had to find all these new pictures. But anyway, uh, I I know you. I know you guys can't see this because I'm sharing my screen. But anyway, I I am working on a, and I I'm digressing again on a predecessor road roster, and a PNR two is on it, and unfortunately, it doesn't have a notation as to what it actually is on my roster but some are and it doesn't make any sense whether it's a flat car or not based on the on the car numbering from the, from the pnr situation but, yes but if the lumber was long maybe it was loaded in the end door could be <laughs> could be But I'm going to digress just for another another moment, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, here, here, Tom. There you go. They're loading the long lumber in the side door. There you go. It looks like Birch Squares to me, Gary. Well, that's what's down here at the bottom that the guy's sitting on. But if you look at the other thing, you can see a, oh, yeah. a long lumber there. So. Oh, that is. You're right. 
<clears throat> You're right. Anyways, back to our regularly scheduled programming. See, here's where you guys can, we can either get into pictures of freight stuff or train operation stuff. What do you want to do? For sure. Train operations. Oh, why did I know you were going to pick that? <laughs> I've got all the pictures. I've looked through a bunch of them. Well, I guess I could now uh, I could throw something out here, but do you really know what you're looking at? Routine. We'll get into the freight operation schedule. So. so since Dave wants, since he's the host, we'll get into this. Anyway, <laughs> the timetable that you're looking at um, happens to be the very last published. Uh, public timetable of the SRNRO. Now, unfortunately for me, I'm looking at this thing and this fits into my whole conspiracy thing about why the SRNRO quit running, which I'm going to save for another Zoom thingy down the road. But anyway, this is the very last public timetable that the SRNRO actually published, April 29th, 1935. Now, you know, we're getting pretty late here, and I've got this all broke down, so we'll be able to go through this whole thing. And on the left, uh, I, I'm assuming you guys can all see that, that is just the mixed train. That is the scheduled mixed. So Phillips, Farmington, Strong, Kingfield, Carabasset, back to Strong, back to Phillips. And the train numbers and times are all there. Any questions about that? So one consist did the whole railroad. This was just the scheduled mixed. Right. It's important. That is an important thing because they don't schedule no, extras. For, Locals, right. extras are not scheduled. Then none of that stuff ever appeared even on the employee timetables. So and they've also got the scheduled motor car to handle some stuff too and people <laughs> and as i was going through my my stuff and trying to get prepped up for this thing i happened to stumble on i, I didn't even realize i had the thing and this details of sur sur service just happens to coincide with that timetable to the second Every train is right to the scheduled time. So whatever was on that timetable is actually on this detailed hey, service, which is absolute to me fascinating. Yeah, hey, hey, Gary, this is details of service. I've never seen a form like this. Well, there you go. So what, what's it telling us? That they when trains are, are arriving and leaving. Trains on time. <laughs> I've never seen a form like this. I, I know I don't have any for the W and W. I've never, never heard of this. It's always been like conductors cards, you know, the the conductors books, stuff like that. But I've never seen anything details of service. This is interesting. Well, it is. It is from the conductor, though. It's signed by the conductor. Yeah, I, I see that, Chris. So it's like that. It's just another version. So Gary, go back one slide. Yeah, I, I was still digesting that. Thanks, so, Chris. Uh, the train at Rangeley, train to 7 a.m., is that the next morning? Or sh should that be 7 p.m.? There is no train to Rangeley. On S18. 18's Phillips. Oh, okay. All okay. right. Anyway, yeah, I'll, yeah, anyway. I'll explain that. S zero is Farmington. S eleven strong. S eighteen. Those are miles, by the way. Okay. So the the train to seven a.m. That's like leaving Phillips, leaving coming Phillip. back to Farmington. So this isn't one day. This is two days. No. Train one, one leaves Farmington at nine thirty-five in the morning. Slow down there, Hoss. 
I thought you were saying num it was just odd numbers are north, even numbers are south. They're not necessarily in order that they were operated or anything. Numbers Correct. don't have that. Train but numbers don't have any meaning that way. You said it was the same train. You mean the same, same train set or just a mixed train? I said the same consist. It's the same consist. It was only one mix scheduled per day, scheduled per day. This is it. Train two starts the day, right? Train two leaves Phillips at 7 a.m. Yep. If you look at the timetable. Oh, the okay. Way. So it starts at Phillips, <clears throat> not at Farmington. I, I get it. I get it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I get it now. I was with S0 as in like the starting point or something. Okay, I get it. Well, I, I, technically, I guess Farmington would be the sort of the starting point going north. But that's not what they were doing. Yeah, I get it now. Yeah, starting at, at Phillips, going to Farmington, then looping around. Okay. Now, I didn't, um, I guess for David, I should have done, I just put one of these all together and put everything in there because he loves that stuff. But I decided to separate all this out because it did get kind of confusing. But this, again, this just covers the mixed train. So the train left Phillips at 7. Why doesn't it say what time it got to Strong? Because I didn't put that in there. Okay. But if over on the timetable, you would be, yeah. It does, sort of. Yeah, leaving times are usually the most important. Most times on a timetable are leaving unless you're at a terminal point, then it would be a arrival. But because a train is not allowed to leave before its scheduled time. It can arrive later, it can leave later. Where is T35? Carabasset, I guess. Carabasset. Yeah. And what is S versus T again? I don't know what the S versus T, what, why did they use S on, on the Rangeley side versus T on the Kingfield side? I don't have that answer. That that terminology is on that next sheet on the next slide, right? For some reason, <laughs> the details sheet, right? They're station just station numbers. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> so this uh, the next one. I got to you know I got to set it up. This is we're getting into David Keith territory here. So I've got everything listed here. So this is from the timetable. That particular timetable has the mix and they're, they're called motors, by the way, not buses. Get that, clear that up. They're not called Lilliputians either, motors. But anyway, there was, you know, and I was putting all this together, there was some confusion here and you can see it on there in the uh, the stations noted in red because there's there's overlap here. If you look, you can see that there's uh, you know 11:55 and 12:30, but they're showing up as mo number six train six motor south. Now this is going south, and so it's Phillips Strong Farmington, but number 18 from the motor from Kingfield is also showing that it's somehow in Strong and Farmington at the exact same time. Well, that's not what was happening. So somewhere in here, train six also became train 18, which was bus five. And I don't know why they did that. I'm not quite sure what the purpose of that was, but you know, for you guys that like to get into that, there you go. There you can it, confuse all the people coming over to operate your railroad. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it was shown that way in the timetable. I didn't have, I didn't sort that out, but that is kind of odd that it shows both going between Strong and Farmington and at the same time. And it's not like you can add a car to it 
right? Because the motor, motors are fixed size. So you would have had to get out of one and into the other. But while we're on this, I, I want to just touch a little bit. In fact, I'm going to go back and look at this again. Because I'm going to remind everybody, this is the very last. This is it. This is 1935. The railroad is supposedly going out of business, even though there isn't, if you want to go dig your books out, they, you don't have to look very far. There isn't a weed on the right of way anywhere on this railroad in 1935. But for some reason, we're about to go out of business. So if anybody's got a rational explanation, I'm, I'm drifting off of the whole operations thing. But I just I find this fascinating that by the way, they're they're doing three round trips a day covering every station on the railroad here. So you got the mix covering everything, plus two round trip buses covering the entire railroad. And they're supposedly. Did they still have the mail contract? They were delivered, they were handling mail. I, I, I don't know about mail contract with what I'm guessing what you mean is with the with the US Postal Service. Yeah, they, they probably, yeah. I don't know. I, they were hauling, you know, pouch mail, but I don't know if they had a contract in place you know, like the wwf did right so but the I, motors also handled less than carload freight right in their trailers i i, I don't know that uh, part of my question is why you have overlap might be as if they had a lot of extra freight or passengers they may have run both motors down to farmington if they needed it well that's very possible Right. And if they didn't need it, they would just leave one sitting there and strong waiting for the other one to return. Well, I, th I think back actually, see, you're, you're actually jumping a little ahead of me here because in a minute you're going to see that phenomenon, which you just brought up. So, but, but you can see the similar in the older timetables. It's not that, I mean, cause obviously you have a full engine and you can put the cars on it, but there are trains that are just, in strong waiting for a train to go all the way down to Farmington and come all the way back and then it to depart. So it just does switching or something else or they go to lunch. Correct. So anything else before I move on to the no. next thing here? We'll wait for you to move on and then we'll come back and we'll ask yeah, you the Absolutely. Now I showed this, a uh, couple of us hung around after the last Zoom meeting and they, they, they know how much Dave loves this stuff, but this uh, next, um, let just get that up here. This is an actual, honest to God, SRNRL train order. And uh, if there's any other ones floating around out there, I'm, I'm not aware of it. This, this, is, this is pretty rare stuff here. And, and it's fascinating because it, it covers some of what you know David was uh, just talking about. So I'll, I'm going to break this down chunk by chunk. So this is June 20th, 1928. Um, as you can see there, it's in effect until further notice. Trains four and five between Rangeley and Farmington motor car with two men. So 1928, they're still using two, you know, a two-man crew on, on all the motor cars, motor cars, not buses, and which is kind of interesting. Might have had to by based on contract. They were not part of the, <coughs> the railroaders <coughs> the union at that time. In fact, I ne they never were. In fact, See, you're getting ahead of me again, because I think that's part of the whole conspiracy of why they shut down what they did, because they were voting on that in 1935. And lo and behold, the railroad decides to close up shop. But I'm saving that for now. 
conversation. Anyway, the uh, the next thing you see there is the first extra and train three. Now, the SR and RL ran almost all of their trains as extras. They're, if you have employees timetables, great. You can go look it all up. Um, most of them, most of the ones I've had had and seen <laughs> basically had one scheduled, either a freight or a mixed. Everything else is is uh, run as extras, all of them. Um, which is why you don't see this stuff, any kind of documentation, because there really isn't any other than unless you have a train order uh, to show that. And in this case, it's you know first first extra and train three. I'm not sure what all this means. <laughs> I don't know if train three was running from Farmington to Phillips and the extra shifting or vice versa. But there is a baggage baggage master associated with this, which is kind of interesting. You get down here to the third extra. Uh, there's two brakemen assigned to this train. So, you know, this is probably one of the local situations. And same with fourth extra, which also had two brakemen. Yeah, everyone who worked on the railroad probably knew what it meant to be first extra, third extra, fourth extra. Because they probably, uh -huh. even though they're not on a schedule, they are regularly run at a certain time. Like the first extra may have been a deadhead of the passenger cars down to Farmington. <clears throat> well, it gives you all the, you know, the call times and, you know, so these, they're basically regular, railroad wise, these are regularly scheduled, but they're not really right, regularly scheduled, if that makes any sense. Oh, they're just not in the timetable. So there's four locomotives in the bus. And this is 1928. Uh, the Kingfield Division uh, trains 15, 18, and 19. And that's the motor car uh, with two men. The second extra and train 17 and 20. And again, I don't know how they're are they differentiating the second extra and train 17? Because train 17 was a regularly scheduled train, if you go back to that timetable. So where is the uh, where, where is the locomotive assignment uh, with the engineer and the fireman? Well, somewhere in my uh, piles of stuff, and I can't find it at the moment. I actually have a bunch of uh, engine house loco assignment sheets and what locomotives were running out of what engine houses. But it doesn't give you engineers and firemen. As you can see here, it's conductors and brakemen. And I'm so I'm guessing the crews changed for whatever reason. Well, I think I think that's what's interesting here, right? Because the the extra would have been named after the locomotive that eventually was assigned to it, right? Correct. And if I were so the the um the engineer and fireman were basically do they stay with the particular locomotive? Because it looks like here the conductor and brakeman are staying with a particular job, whereas maybe the engineer and fireman are being assigned to particular locomotives. And then you sort of match them up based on availability. Is that is that kind of what's going on here? I can't really answer that. <clears throat> I'm I'm going to assume. I hate it. I hate assuming, but uh, it seems that some engineers had their favorite locomotives, like and, with and they, and they had seniority or something, so they could kind of pick and choose. 
Well, that would be based on if the locomotive was actually, you know, stationed in their whatever their division. Well, yeah. Right. And well, you know, if the the locomotive, you know, you got to remember now, you know, the SRL took care of their stuff, so this stuff is regularly going into shop and being serviced, and, you know, cleaned, you know, the valves timed, whatever. Yeah, but train number and locomotive number are two different things. Correct. Well, no, but not for extras. For extras, the, the extra is named after the locomotive, right? Yes. They would use the locomotive in train orders and, um, you know, it would be extra 24 north. And the order would be addressed to something like the conductor and engineer of, en of engine 24 run extra Farmington to Phillips. And then it becomes extra 24 north. I, I know what you're saying, but that doesn't make sense in terms of this form. Um, because locomotives are not always running. There's doubt. Right. Yeah, that's why this that's why this, this form does not list a single train right, or a single the, locomotive. It does exactly. not list any. Okay, that's locomotive. what I'm saying. So that's that's kind of what I was saying, is that it's like it's interesting to me that it's like this form says here's here's a you know first second third extra but the extra hasn't been named yet because they haven't paid, they haven't matched it with the locomotive because it's sort of a general standing order so the same the same kind of brakemen were assigned to particular extra runs but right. you hadn't assigned the locomotive to it so it couldn't be named so we had we had this conversation on one of the lists because i think you could have it like a train 15 but also have a a different quote-unquote train that was extra 15 because it was run by locomotive 15, but they're totally different trains. Okay, yeah. Right. And they can be on the line at the same time. Yeah. What's interesting, I think what this is, it's this isn't a typical train order. This is a crew assignment order. Right. Or something to the crews. This is not really a, you know, what the train will do. This is just an assignment sheet. Well, Christopher, go get your conductor's book out because it's all pretty much laid out in there for you. But anyways, I, I, I got it open here on the other screen and how they listed, they're all extras in the conductor, all of them in the conductor's book. And I just flipped open to whatever page this is. And it's extra 19 and it's locomotive 19 and Stuart was the engineer. So if you need more detailed information, you can get it there. So it, it goes through, as I think somewhere in, in this. <coughs> I didn't I didn't use that. Anyway, somewhere in the in the book here, there is a I'll have to go find it real quick. They do, I I I listed. Now this was over a three month period that they actually listed the locomotives and, and I'll just, I'll go through it real quick. But anyways, uh, locomotive five uh, was listed 13 times, locomotive 15, 14, locomotive 16, 17, 18, 21, 22, <coughs> and 24. So, you know, there's, this was probably a random thing based again on on service or you know who was ever regularly assigned to you know whatever locomotive you know whether you know Dana Aldridge you know his favorite engines twenty four or whatever the case was um, so that's the best I can tell you in that situation okay. Chris? Oh, my, my question was answered minutes ago. You're all good. <laughs> okay, well, that's the only train orders that I have. I don't have any other. I haven't seen any. So we've covered that, the train order the situation. And again, I mean, that's it's pretty fascinating stuff that, um, you know, for in 1928, you know, they're, they're still pretty busy. Still doing a lot of stuff, so. Anyway, 
So I want to get into the, the photographic evidence of what were they really hauling routine. And there's not a, there's not a whole lot of that, but um, <coughs> I think I showed this one other time. This just happens to be a bunch of frigid airs. And uh, the photo was actually taken in 1936, but that's kind of irrelevant. The, had it been, you know, 1934, 35, these frigid airs would probably been loaded in a box car. These were going to Strong. There was an actual frigid air dealer in Strong. So it looks to me like there's quite a few of them. So again, it's, you know, it's an opportunity to, you know, what, call something different, Let's put, put something out there it's, and in a different destination. So had this actually been in a, an SRNRL box car or two, I'm not quite sure where these were. If these have gone to the freight house, if they've gone to a team track, I'm pretty sure wherever the Frigidaire dealer was probably did not have his own siding, even in you know two foot land. Questions? And I can't tell you a whole lot more about this other than what you're seeing in the picture. Other than that, is the freight house. Farmington happened to have several. Uh, whatever creameries this just happens to be a cream separator whatever the difference was but it is spelled that way on the building except uh, ray tours that could just be an advertising sign cream separators were used on the farms to take the cream off the milk i fully appreciate that but this was a creamery yeah but they wouldn't they wouldn't have had separators there i don't know what they had there i'm just telling you it was a creamery and that's noted in a number of different places so whether that was just some signage doesn't matter it was the creamery so your point is they didn't separate the cream there no, well, my point is they weren't selling separators. If that's a creamery, then they would have been having deliveries of either milk or cream. Yes. That's the point. Yes, it's a creamery of some sort. I don't know what they were selling. <clears throat> the box car over on its side just happens to be one of the so called dairy cars. It's, it is Boxcar 59. There are a couple of other images to show that car, and and it was a it was used. In fact, it still survives. And in fact, I think it's the only uh, it was double floored, uh, double walled, and I believe it was the only box car that had four truss rods. So for you detail hounds out there, um, it was a very very unique car. But anyways, this. Uh, these sightings did serve the whatever you want to call it, but it was a green room. There was another one in West Farmington uh, that was a Turner Center Dairy Association facility, but that was over on the other side of town. Now, whether anything that came in on the SRNRL found its way over there. I don't know. I don't have that answer, but there was another, there was a Turner Center Creamery over on the other side of town. Gary, <laughs> the logic in this part of the world would be that the sign is either a business name or it's advertising. If it's a creamery, then it is advertising. It's not that Empire cream separators are being made inside that building, if it's a creamery. It's getting cream either in milk and separating it or in cream that the farmers separated and sending down um, cans of cream and what's leaving is butter. That could very well be. Unfortunately, I don't have that answer. Hey, Gary. Yes. Is that... Is that crane on the standard gauge, you think? Yes. 
Okay. Thank you. Yeah, there's there's several other photos of this of this wreck. But it's the building was kind of what was was important to the to the narrative here. So in one of our other previous discussions, there was some, you know, like where's all the cream cans? Well, right there. And there's actually a couple of, you know, this picture's been around. It's it's a postcard view. Um, there's some, you know, fascinating things going on here in the picture, other than the pile of cream cans. As you can see over here on the left side of the picture, Strong Creamery has not yet been built. This box car in the back here is lettered SR and RL. The flat car is SRRR, and that's a P and R box car. So pretty cool image. Uh, coal part full of coal, which is also, I think, important. And Harry, backing up, backing up there, that last picture. Are they are they lights like to just to the the left of the uh, the signal mast? Looks like a bubble gum machine on top of a staff. I see one on each corner. This is the station lights, lamps. You mean this? I don't know if you can right here. Yeah, right there, right there. Yeah. Yeah, there's station platform lamps. There's one there. One there. There's a rabbit hole you can go down, Harry. What station lamps? Yeah. Yeah, there's there's another, there's another one to the right too. Yeah, yeah. there's one. That's what I was going to say, Chris. It's probably one on each corner. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And what's what's the what the uh, weather vane? What is? Somebody told me one time what that is up there exactly. Usually, it's like a horse or you know a bird or something. What is that? That's a pharaoh. <laughs> Pharaoh style or Egyptian style banner. Why? <laughs> that was the style Victorian era when the Phillips, um, the, the one in, in Phillips still exists and it got restored about 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And they had a whole article on it in the SRRL Museum newsletter. Okay. It's some, it's some Egyptian name or something. Okay. You good? Yep, yeah, I'm good. <clears throat> well, it's pretty, this, this picture's pretty busy, and uh, I, I can use this to, you know, cover a whole bunch of things here, other than, you know, there's some more milk cans over there. <clears throat> I don't know that mother's bread was actually in those cases, but there's a lot happening here. And aside from, you know, all the, the dead uh, deer carcass skins, um, but this should give you, the, you know, the modeler many other opportunities for stuff to put on your station plot. Because you know, one of the things that um, that obviously the railroad did cater to, as Jim, you know, pointed out earlier about you know the little pushy and hauling the hoity toities up the Marple Station. Um, thing, but you know, aside from uh, that, there were you know dozens and dozens of camps all over Franklin County, and most of those people were being served by the SRNRL, and everything coming and going came by railroad. I didn't get into a lot of that stuff <laughs> in the freight receipts, but I do have one that you know is clearly nothing but uh, bedding beds uh, for one of the camps. I mean, I think it was York's camps up there, but you know, and, and basically probably filled the box car. Hey Gary, well, behind uh, Mr. Bobcat Holder Man, is that a cattle ramp? Yes. Something else to come and go. Yeah, this is a, you know, it's a fascinating photograph. And, you know, it's, again, there, there is a lot of stuff going on here. And again, I, most of this stuff isn't going in the, you know, costing the end of the, you know, the combine. 
Um, you know, when we're only seeing, you know, about eight or 10 feet of station platform here, strong station platform was, I, I can back up. There. I mean, you're just, you know, looking at a very small section of the, of the platform. So we're going too fast. But, so, you know, I don't know what else is on the other, you know, to the right and the left. So the mother's bread boxes, they came out of Portland, Maine. So they actually shipped bread in them, then we returned. Very good. Empty, I'm assuming. Yes. Wow, that's expensive to ship the box all the way back. Empty, ship air back. Not surprised, I'm just saying. You know, David. We used to, oh, go ahead, David. We used to return our, our milk bottles, right, when we were kids. Yep. And milk was delivered on the old doorstep every day or every other day we'd put them back out there and the guy would collect them yeah this is jim funny you should say that david um gary and i were talking about this presentation and i have a freight tariff and classification book from the w w 1906 in one of the paragraphs it talks about shipping empty containers back to their destination how, how they're handled how much it costs um so on and so forth so that that is an actual thing of shipping basically post holes as the truckers call it. Yeah, the containers cost more than shipping them back. Yep. Well, if you look at some of the freight rates they're charging, I'm going to go back to the that the 1881 for 2,700 pounds. The the freight was only six dollars and seventeen cents, and I get it. That's 1881 dollars. So what would have, you know, several pounds of empty box cost? Yeah, not much. Not much. You're talking about two or three cents. some more cream cans but um there's some other things obviously going on here uh, the creamery is obviously you know there and station lamps have been changed you can see there there's a scale here so that's kind of cool there's some uh, bundles of i'm not quite sure what this is over here tom but could be Bags of grain, maybe. Right there. Or sugar yeah. or rice. <laughs> Gary, is your photo clear enough to make out what it says on the sign just above? Yeah, we'll, we'll find out. Yeah, it's American Express. American Express. Yeah, that's the same, that's the same company that was on the WFA Hmm. Okay. Yeah, and the sign was red, white, and blue. White background. <laughs> I don't know, Gary. Those sacks look like grain to me. It's very possible. I'm just saying. Yeah, it could be anything, but. Any Almost. chance it's wool? Hey, you guys, wait, you slow down. You're getting ahead of me here. <laughs> Well, there was, there was wool, I think, in Phillips. Okay, so since we, we had a rush ahead of, you know. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump right to it. So this is going to be another one of those. How many of you guys knew there was a woolen mill in Phillips, other than the people that were on and stayed on with us after the last Zoom? And yeah. well, aside from them, Tom, how many knew there was a woman mill in, in Phillips? I did not know that. Well, there you go. And if you look over on the right, I conveniently have a picture of a... Hello. If somebody can prove that's something other than that. 
okay, but I'm gonna, that's what I'm going with. And that's Phillips Station, by the way, so it's not something I pulled off the internet. Hmm. So, granted, this is not online. However, they were clearly shipping this out. We'll get to that in a second, but there is a big bag there that I'm going to assume is wool. Now, whether it came from this place, or this place may have been burned down by then, I don't know. But anyways, it's the Phillips Woolen Mill, and I think that's a big bag of wool. And again, there's another commodity that you can be loading up in your box cars. And just by sheer luck, what do you think they're loading there? Oh, it's got to be grain. Oh, it's got to be grain and not wool. But I guess it's, I don't know, if that's grain and those two guys are muscling that, those two guys are badasses. That's <laughs> I thought it was pretty funny. You're talking about wool, then you said shear. I thought that was funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think you and I are the only ones that are getting the jokes here, Gary. I know. It's just yeah, good. I know. It's it, it's it's almost nine o'clock. So, hey, yeah. Gary, Gary, on that on that last photo of the wool on the station platform, did you colorize that yourself? Well, I think Jim gets credit for that, but yeah, we did colorize. That. Yeah, we took a couple uh, photographs, and I have uh, a colorization program. We were running stuff through just to see how close our guesses were. Yeah, it's cool. I, yeah, I think this was one of them. <clears throat> yeah, it's cool. Yeah, so that's probably not wool they're loading into the boxcar because they would deliver wool to the woolen mill, not ship wool from a woolen mill. Well, you're making an assumption that the mill was still there, and I don't know that it was. Oh, I see. They're shipping it offline is what you're thinking. Correct. Yes, this photo was taken by Elliot Stewart. It was probably taken in 1935, and that mill may have been gone. So it's possible. I, I mean, it's, uh, I'm going to assume this is probably some type of wool that, you know, the sheep could have been sheared. They stuffed it in bags came down on the wagon, throw it in a boxcar, and it's going down to wherever. So, I mean, there were certainly other woolen mills in the state of Maine. They didn't have to be just in Phillips. But anyway. See, and I can relate to that. On the, the Waynesburg and Washington, after it closed down, the Waynesburg Station was a wool storage house. So all of the farmers were bringing their wool into the storage house. They would pack it into bags. And then the Monongahela Railroad would come in on the standard gauge, load the boxcars, and it would go out of Greene County to be processed at some mill. So I related this photo to that incident on the WW posted abandonment. Gary, down here in Australia, wool uh, um, um, was always transshipped in bales. Uh, which are basically big square bags, but they're about um, um, three foot six square on the base and probably about five feet tall. Um, now, granted, we've probably got more sheep down here uh, than you've got uh, in the entire Northern Hemisphere. But the idea of shipping wool in bag, in Hessian bags, uh, I think would be regarded by 25 million Australians as a very strange thing to do. Uh, my understanding is that cotton's normally shipped in bales too. Um, uh, but you are happy to tell me that North Americans ship wool in bags. Well, if you're asking me for my expert opinion on how we shipped wool, I can't do that because I'm not really a wool expert. But that's the woolen mill. That looks, if that, I, I, is that a bag of cotton? You can't grow cotton in Maine, can you? There's no landscape no in Maine, but. Um, 
yeah, what's your evidence that the bag on the station platform is going, is a bag of wool going to that woolen mill? Well, I don't know that it came from that woolen mill. Uh, uh, yeah, just because they're on the same slide, don't assume that one is associated with the other. That's what Gary well, that's was really what I'm saying, yes. Well, no, that's what he said. Don't assume that. Mm, yeah. This was an okay. illustration. Yeah, now this, this picture's problem, or the, the picture with the bag of the mystery stuff, it was taken around 1915. So it is possible that the woolen mill was still there. Okay. Hey Gary, the only, the only Gary, place is there any is there any chance John Gotti is in that bag? Um, no, I'm going with the other guy. There's <laughs> always a chance. Jimmy Hoffa. Oh Hoffa, you're right. You're right. Hoffa's better. Going with Hoffa. Gary, the only forget the time frame. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the only, the, the only basis. The only basis that I can find for there being a linkage um, is if that is um, what is called blanket combings, which is basically you make blanket wool, blanket fabric, and uh, you get lots of fluff on it. And it's all combed uh, to basically have clean cloth. And the waste fiber is, used for all sorts of things like um, packing in cavities for insulation and whatnot. And that here would come in a recycled bag that might have had chaff in it before uh, or anything else. Um, as a waste product from wool processing, I might understand that being the contents. Because this is, is, is fluff, basically that we can see poking out of holes of this. Um, I'll make a bid for wool combings. Blanket combings. It could be packing for uh, <laughs> freight car bearings. Yeah, I was gonna agree. It could be um, what's called batting, batting which was um, yeah. put in, in journals and things like that for holding oil. Sometimes in the pots of kerosene lanterns, keep them from sloshing. Whatever it is, we ship to Phillips. Correct. Why must it be shipped on the evidence that we have here in? Why can't it be being shipped out? Say that again. Uh, what evidence have we that it's being shipped in? Um, if it's blanket combings, it's being shipped out. Well, I, I guess that's one of those things where we could beat to death all night, but I don't have that answer. And I, mean, I can't argue what is or isn't in it. To me, it looked like some sort of something came off of a sheet, stuffed into a bag. It fit into my point here about the woolen mill, which is pretty much all I'm trying to do here. Not, I don't, I'm not trying to debate what is or being shipped from where or to where, other than it's a commodity that we as modelers could be stuffing in our model boxcars and moving to wherever. So this is the uh, cannery in Strong. And I, I think we're all aware of the, the cannery in Strong. If you're not, that's it. I mean, it does say corn factory on there. And the husking sheds are off to the right there, right there. 
this was a pretty big operation and you know the the entire complex was still there until i don't know 10 15 years ago but i believe it was the only cannery located on line i'm not aware of any other canneries on the srnrl but a lot of action going on there a bunch of cars of sawn lumber there some pulp racks or rack cars two coal these are coal cars by the way which is kind of interesting okay so, so all they that? did was make all they did there was can corn that was it <laughs> well that's a good question and that's another one of those you know mystery wool bag whatever it happens to be in there things that there were uh pea patches and you know bean farms in the area so is it possible they were canning other things yeah i'm gonna say yeah I mean, I would. What did they just work two months out of the year? I mean, I, right. I find that hard to believe. <laughs> There's a another photo of that, and you see the the siding and to the cannery. I mean, there's a lot of cars sitting there, so you know the siding was fairly long, uh, which is uh, and you <coughs> clearly see the you know, the elevation difference between the, the main line and, and the siding, which is, um, and this is the over, overpass right here. Yeah, I think, I think the last time we were there, Gary, that, not that building, but the one 90 degrees to it was cut like half back. Remember yeah. that? And there were actually um, old labels from the corn, the corn crates or whatever, Remember it had like an Indian head on it or something like that? Yeah. They had actually pasted large labels that were still stuck on the walls inside that building. It's pretty amazing. I did take some, take some pictures, but where they are, who knows? All right. Let me get back to where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> there's a lot of action going on here. If you look down here at the toothpick clearing house, you see there's Three boxcars sitting there. It's kind of interesting. So right after the railroad was taken out of here, they stripped this thing right down to to road level. So this, when you go in there, it's it's kind of hard to recognize. Is one, one the cannery's long gone, and they the grade is now down to road level, and you can clearly see how much higher this was and as the front of the building says it's corn flour and mill and feed and there's a bunch of, as you can see here in the front, there's a bunch of barrels here. So I'm guessing that was for their flour and feed. And I'm not sure what year this is. Uh, there's, this picture is actually pretty cool. It shows the steam line right there. And if you look real, real close, this is the grain building extension. And you can see there is another door. So no, I didn't put that in the kit because I didn't have this picture at that time, but there is a matching door in the, in the grain building on the other end. So anyway. Is that a fire hydrant? Say that again. No, down the middle. Down. Down to the right. Yeah, right there. The fire hydrant. Yeah. I don't know what happened there. 
Gary, before you move on to this one, can you move back one? I think the other interesting thing about the uh, um, the Foster building is I think they are barrel ends on the first floor in the uh, seen through the windows. And standing on end on the full, on the uh, most rightward window, standing upright. Right there. Yep. Well, all right, I think we've you know we've covered this you know winter store. We've certainly had you know conversations about you know the winter store in the past, and uh, but you know obviously it was a uh, it was a big deal. Uh, certainly a lot of things you know going on with this building and the business and they you know they clearly supplied uh, you know corn flour and feed uh, you know to the area and i don't know when they uh, stopped using the you know the grain facility and when they stopped you know bringing cars in and out of there but uh, according to uh, Bill Jensen, the, the siding was still in place in 1970. You know, the doors were still there. You could still open them and the siding was still in place in 1970. So. But moving on, uh, this is uh, clearly Kara Bassett. And the reason I used this photograph was uh, the 55 gallon drums. And, you know, he didn't start really paying attention to that, to 55 gallon drums, you know, until I you know, started looking for photos for this presentation. And, you know, I don't know that those colors are correct, um, but they're clearly there. I'm guessing they're empty and they're probably going back. Because you had to ship back your empty 55 gallon drums. And there are, I, I did, again didn't show every you know freight bill and freight receipt, but you know there's uh, clearly uh, freight bills you know show you know, barrels and drums of oil. I don't know what kind. It didn't specify. It doesn't specify. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly you know what kind. I mean, there were, obviously there's several mills in the area, so you know maybe they needed lubricating oil. You know the other question that keeps popping up, at least for me and some discussions I've had is, how did they get their gas? Is there, they, there's cars up there. Certainly there were gas stations up there. So how, how do these people get their gas? I think this picture probably probably should pretty much spell it all out for you. And these obviously are empties. Now what they're doing with them, I don't know. This was their team track right here. And there's their loading platform. Obviously the toothpick clearinghouse and the creamery are not in place yet. But uh, the Daggett and Wool store was, you know, clearly a pretty big deal. And there is another great photo that I didn't include taken from the other way looking this direction. There is a huge Soconi sign on the other side of this building. Now, whether they were a Soconi dealer, I don't know. I don't really see a gas pump there or any place, but there is a big Sakoni sign on the other side of the building. So it's pretty fascinating because every everything you see there, I I'm gonna go out on that on that limb that 100 percent of that stuff all came by by rail. And you know so these cars were uh, I think there's two cars you can <laughs> you know, that were probably material for them. There's a picture of the creamery when it was new that was, you know, just been completed. 
Now, what I don't know and I can't answer is, you know, just exactly how much business did, did this particular creamery do? How much were they taking in? How much were they shipping out? I, I don't know. I don't know that. I mean, it appears to have been used, but I certainly don't have a whole lot of information. But, you know, going back uh, to a couple of other uh, Zooms, you know, the railroad did have dairy uh, products cars, so they definitely were hauling uh, stuff, whether it's to there or from there. But at least for a period of time, you know, dairy products were, uh, you know, certainly important to the railroad. What were they doing for cheese in Maine? Like, I, I don't see any cheese factories. Like, here in Ontario, every little town had a cheese factory for making cheese. cannot answer that. I can't imagine that somebody wasn't making their own, but I don't know about on a commercial level. <laughs> There's uh, some pretty interesting things going on here. Um, aside from the wagon wheels weren't for some from some busted down wagon that just you know fell under the weight of the grain sacks, but there's a whole lot of stuff piled up here, and. The little chicken crate. Yep. There's a bunch of chicken crates there. It's all kinds of stuff piled up here along the station. Oh, so there's that is the stock car there, by the way. And more than likely the manure spreader was delivered by train. Well, so that goes back to that. Where's the pictures of all this stuff? Because that ha that certainly happened. This stuff didn't, you know, they they didn't. Some cow didn't pick it up in in Farmington and trudge it all the way up to Kingfield. I mean, this thing was loaded on a car and and you know hauled in by railroad. But there is just there is no photographic evidence of this stuff, which I'm not quite sure I I get. But anyway, here's a a little bit better view of the freight station and, and all the busyness going on there, um, which is kind of cool. This, aside from, you know, number 10 being on a, on a head end of that freight there. Uh, there's a bunch of trunks, a bunch of em empty chicken crates, a bunch of other boxes laying there. And, but it's, again, it's just, you know, some detail that, you know, we as as modelers could be using, and uh, you know what was in there. I don't know, but I do believe that you know at one time these these freight sheds, uh, you know, were were used way more than because we typically don't see cars parked next to these things. We just we don't see that, and you know, so it's real easy to kind of dismiss them. But I think at one time they were. You know, extremely important to, uh, particularly for, for a railroad that was hauling, you know, probably just about 80, 90 percent of everything northbound was LCL. Is that is that number 10's original cab? Uh, no, that's a steel cab. Okay. You know, it's weird that the freight chair, being in such a utilitarian building, has corbels on it on under the rafter eaves. And there's another. I'm not quite sure what this structure is, but that doesn't really show up in other photographs. Coal shed. And the coal shed was on the other side. Looks like bags of cement in that building.
it is possible. I don't know, but there's some cool stuff going on here. What you're looking at there is the uh, barrel loading rig from the uh, Brackley Apple Barrel Mill, which is out of scene to the right. In all right, what happened there? Go on. I haven't really seen this on anybody's layout. I'll expect to in a month or two. This is pretty interesting. Probably more so this picture. So there's, it's not too often that you actually see them in the process of loading things into you know, an SR and RL box car. There's, there's a couple of really good shots in Kingfield showing them loading bags of spools and bobbins into box cars and burlap bags, but <coughs> these aren't spools and bobbins, they're, they're clearly barrels, which is kind of interesting. So obviously not all of them made it into the uh, box cars as you can see down here, but there's a lot of action going on here. And not to mention this is mud season, which is one of the reasons for the railroad in the first place. Well, it's, and I'm glad you brought that up. Um, just exactly how did you get around here? And that's an open question. I'm looking for some, you know, Route 4 from Farmington wasn't paved until a year after the railroad quit. So this goes back to my conspiracy. Like, what were these people doing to get anything out of Farmington six months out of the year? Because that's what the road looked like right there. So, Gary, I don't think they're unloading barrels. They're no, lo loading barrels. They're loading boxes. Loading. You could see the box on the conveyor on the left corner, and you could see two of them at his foot. They're loading boxes of canned apples. Fantastic. We're going to have you do the next Zoom. <laughs> well, there was some discussion that apples were actually shipped here um, from up off the F&M. I thought I read that somewhere. Yeah, and barrels were shipped in apples historically. Barrels were shipped in apples? That's Sorry, cool. apples were... Right. But in the pile of logs yeah. under the right there? Pile of logs. Under the bed. Well, that could be true. Daryl does have a, a Brackley apple crate. Whatever. Yeah, and sure, it ran both ways. Like, you ship barrels in, they can them, and then ship the boxes of product out. Either way. That's a conveyor belt going across there? Yeah. It's, is that that wheel there is at the bottom? Yeah, right there. Yeah. And you can see the train chain drive or something hanging down. Yeah, okay. In the background. You need to ask Al. In the background, does the road tape off that high like that, that grade? Yep. Wow. That's why the county or whoever, when the railroad left, was so quick to tear out the railroad so they could ease the joint there, ease the grades and everything else. Yeah, this, this is the main line right here. The cannery is over here. Yeah, it's probably a car on a cannery sitting there, that black spot. The... the this is kind of the back road. The main road went under the railroad grade right about in here. So there was an over railroad overpass there.
Oh, I think I got about two more pictures here. <coughs> <coughs> So this is uh, clearly Rangeley. And there's obviously a boxcar sitting on the, uh, at the freight shed. But this was kind of what fascinated me here is, I don't know, seven, eight, what appear to be empty 55 gallon drums. And again, I have no idea what was in them, what they got, where they're going other than it's just a it's a great photo that that shows that detail look at the size of the barrels on the left though is that one barrel no there's, no there's two or three there there's one there one right here yeah and that packing crate whatever it is yeah, I, don't, I have no idea what that is. They're still using RPO-8. So I'm not quite sure what year this would have been, but. Hey, Gary, just to add to your uh, stuff that could be hauled by the railroad. So one of the first things that the WWNF Railway Museum got as kind of like an artifact was um, a huge panel of a crate that was yeah. used to haul a piano. Yeah. Uh, and they had that up in their, uh, in their freight house, their gift shop. And it stenciled all the different railroads. I think it starts with like the Boston and Maine or the New Haven going all the way up to Maine. Oh yeah, there's there's a bunch of examples here in, in my pile of stuff of you know household goods being shipped and uh, you know furniture that sort of thing. So it's these are things that we as I when I was doing all my dry runs for this and pretty much everybody I talked to says, oh yeah, yeah we all say that like we all know that when yeah as I. I told Steve when I was talking to him about this, yeah, it might be in our subconscious, but most of this is not in our conscious because this isn't what we're thinking about. And, you know, so when, until you really, you know, start pointing this stuff out and, you know, looking and digging deep and, you know, what exactly, what was in these barrels? You know, so I'm kind of curious, okay, what were they getting there? Because something came in, in those barrels, but really don't know what. And, but it's, uh, you know, it does become fascinating when you start lining all this stuff up as to, you know, what commodities were inbound. <coughs> we, we pretty much know what was going out. Or at least 80 or 90% of it was, you know, product of the woods. You know, I think that's a given, but it's the inbound stuff that uh, that there seems to be very little you know information about or even any thought about but you know so those loaded box cars going south didn't all come back empty you know a lot of them had stuff in them and they were going someplace they just weren't going to some siding and being parked there and you know until the <laughs> until the toothpick mill needed the box car to, you know, load up with some more toothpicks. You know, so, again, you know, going back to my original, my opening salvo about, <laughs> you know, how can we, you don't need 4,000 square feet to model the SR and RL. You know, you can do this in a much smaller space by, you know, allowing yourself to think, you know, outside the parameters of what your layout space actually is and, you know, using the, uh, mixed train, locals, extras, that sort of thing is your concept as opposed to, I mean, the SRRL was not a bridge route. I mean, it just wasn't. I mean, the Sandy River was originally, but, you know, the, S the SRRL, point A, point B. And, you know, and it, it obviously did a job. And, 
and just trying to look for different things about what, you know, what the railroad was all about and what it was called. And, uh, I think one of the big things that's pointed out in your presentation, but should be obvious, is how big the transfer sheds and how important those transfer sheds were in Farmington. And that how much came in is less than carload freight, but I also bet that a lot went out as less than carload freight. Things like toothpicks, that they probably they might have gotten shipped as a whole box car down to Farmington, but they went as part of a load out on the main central. And so a lot of finished, the smaller finished novelty products went out as partial loads. And combined with other things, and they went down the line on the main central to some main, some significant point, and then got redistributed again and shipped across country as they went to freight houses and everything all across country. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, again, I don't, I don't know how much thought we all put into that. And you know, particularly when it relates to you know model railroads, like do we really need to think about that? And well, probably not. But outside of you know, like this this Zoom presentation, there really wouldn't be much discussion about this sort of thing. But when you look at Farmington Yard, which was a mile long, that was mostly there because of what was being fed to the main central, not kind of the other way around right. and, you know so there was a lot of stuff going out of there but there was certainly a lot of stuff coming in too i mean it's you know farmington was the largest you know city in the county and you know all these other towns were getting there as you know hopefully showed everybody tonight they were getting a lot of stuff and i don't mean you know five pounds of it in some cases tons of it and you know so there was a lot of cars being moved whether it was lcl or whatever it was um, which is fine <laughs> you know and uh, we're not going to be that particular about you know in a, in a model railroad setting about you know whether the box car is full or not most of us probably aren't going to care <laughs> but you know the mill like you know the toothpick mill and the wing wing mill and winter mill and you know a couple of other large operations the turning mills not the, not the uh, saw mills uh you know we're certainly i do think shipping box car loads out and but one srl box car does not equate to a standard gauge box car either right you know is that a track crew there because if you look at the bottom that one rail looks like it ends on the siding right here no yeah no i think that's just a little hiccup in the photo okay so the last picture that i <coughs> plan to show <coughs> is this one and yeah, you know, I mean, I guess it's it's probably more with taking a locomotive eighteen, but that's not why I'm using. I, I use it because of the you know the load of coal, which was uh, you know a fairly important thing, uh, not just to the railroad, but some of the towns along the railroad as well also received coal. And I don't know if we, uh, I don't know if we pay any attention to that at all. I think you know most of us just assume that the railroad was. You know, hauled in some coal for its own use, and that was the end of that. And that's not true at all. Um, there actually are a couple. I didn't use them here. Maybe I should have. Um, there are a couple of photos uh, taken in Rangeley of that show you know coal cars sitting there. And in fact, it was a uh, one of the last photos uh, taken of Rangeley when there was still equipment sitting there. There's a several coal cars sitting on the siding. And I think this was like 1934. So I mean that's fairly late. And so somebody up there was getting car loads, not a car load, car loads of coal. And I don't 
think that was railroad use because there was a coal shed in Rangeley and uh, I doubt they'd be bringing, certainly not in 1934, would they be hauling carloads of coal up there to fill up that coal shed. So I think coal, you know, was a one of those things that we, you know, have a tendency to overlook for some reason. But uh, they certainly did, you know, move it. And I think I showed back in that uh, material out of the conductor's book that they were moving hard and soft coal. So it isn't just for railroad use. So with that, I don't really have um, anything else as far as you know, photographs that I plan on using for this. So any questions, anything anybody wants to say, go ahead, get it out, shout, blurt it out, whatever, because I'm kind of, I've covered hopefully, I'm sure I didn't answer everybody's questions. I'm sure there's still, you know, uh, well, I know I did. I, I, I'm going to tell you all one more thing. There isn't anybody alive today that's going to answer all the questions. If there's anybody out there that thinks that they're going to answer all these, that's, no, they're not. That guy doesn't exist. You know what? There, I don't know where I read it at. Whether it was, I'm assuming it was the, one of the main railroads uh, during the depression, uh, the near one of the the uh, water towers, water stations. Uh, kids would set ca set cans up on the fence to get the uh, railroad guys to throw coal at it, and then they would take the coal home and use it at their parents' house. And um, Another thing entirely different was that the lady that invented earmuffs uh, lived in Kingfield. More useless information. Hey, Gary, on the last photo, was the guy pulling a pole out from the front of the locomotive to push that coal car? No. Um, okay. No, that's um, not what's there's going on there. There's no polling pockets. This was actually taken during uh, scrapping. So, what was the original question? Because we, I, I got. Because <laughs> I tried. Um, was wondering if he was pulling out a pole to do polling on that coal car. No. Anyway, okay, uh, Gary, this has been great. Lots of lots of food for thought. Well, I again, I I don't. I don't know if I answered everybody's questions. That's a, I think it's very complicated. Um, I mean, as you can see in some, you know, some of the discussion about, you know, whether it was wool or wasn't wool. <laughs> Who cares? It's to me, it's just, you know, we're, we're trying to. Uh, no, the fact that there was a woolen mill means we could ship wool to Phillips. That's, all we need to know and, and that's was kind of what this is all about is just you know giving us as modelers again i you know went through this in my head day after day after day and you know, how do i want to present this and um, you know so i think from a modeler's perspective it probably made a little more sense because we're really not going to care whether there's cream in the cream can or milk or butter or whatever it is we're going to put a little cream can or a bunch of them on the platform and that's that and you know we can come up with an empty chicken crate or an empty you know bread box or you know a hundred empty 55 gallon drums but it gives us you know this the idea of different commodity that you know the railroad was you know physically moving them yeah and i think it just you know from my perspective you know for uh, you know i don't know how long all of you have been you know following this stuff and, but um yeah, i certainly didn't you know think about this the first time i started mo modeling the two footers i could have cared less yeah it's just, hey, this is neat stuff this is cool but you know as the years went on 
you know, really what, what was this railroad really all about? You know, so I, that was really all I was trying to present is just, you know, give us a little bit different look, you know, try to, you know, look into, you know, how some of these trains and the traffic patterns went and is it, you know, it is involved. But again, this is this was leading up into my whenever, uh, whenever I just I can uh, put this Zoom together with my conspiracy theory of why the you know uh, it isn't a conspiracy theory. I think it's I think I've got some pretty good ideas as to what happened. But uh, anyways, I, I'm sure there's going to be lively debate when that, <laughs> when that Zoom comes around. So, but this was all leading up to that. Well, I'd like to thank you very much, Gary. It was very informative tonight, as it always is. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, hey, Gary, thank you. Yep, thank you. Had, had yeah, thanks, Gary. That was great. Spikes. Excellent. <laughs> Look Gary, forward to the conspiracy yeah. theory video. <laughs> Gary, I'll extend the sentiments too, mate. Uh, excellent presentation. You teach us to interrogate the photographic evidence much, much, much more rigorously than I certainly tend to do. Yes, it's a picture. What's it focused on? It's usually the locomotive. Let's look at the locomotive detail. And all of the stuff that's peripheral to the main focus of the photographer has got lots of information in it too, if we interrogate it critically. So thank you for reinforcing that really potently uh, today. It's just excellent, mate. It really That's is. That's what Thank we you. want to do. We, we all want to look at the pretty picture with the rods down and, oh, there's a great side view. And it's, yes, those things are all important. They are. But what did this railroad really do? It wasn't this tinker. What, again, I had to go back and read it today. And I Moody's dedication about his uh, Lilliputian adventures in the elfin realm. And that's a quote. And, you know, and I, I think we've, most of us, you know, probably got drawn into this by, you know, some of Moody's writings, but um, it's a little bit more than just the elf in the realm. As cute as that may sound and as interesting as, you know, it made it for probably many of us, there's a little bit more involved than that. So, there you go. Anybody, Tom, what else? You must have something to add. Or need to leave. Well, what I found interesting <laughs> is they, they ship bread from Portland. So it had to come up on the main central, got transferred to the Sandy River, got delivered to a hotel. Who else would be buying commercial bread in that neck of the woods? Like it's all, you know, there'd be receipts. It'd have to be tracked. It'd have to be shipped. It'd have to be returned. It's it's a big business. Correct. Is you know, um, that was big business, like you said. That was big business. It's still big business up there. And, uh, you know, the, the Rangely Lake House, the Rangely End, I mean, those are the two of the largest, were the largest on that side in the Kingfield had its own, but um, the Rangeley Lake House, that place was enormous. Yeah. I mean, you know, they weren't talking about five or six people. They were probably talking about hundreds of people. And they all had to get there somehow. And when they all got there, they had to eat probably three times a day. And most of that stuff probably came by rail. Again, it's real easy for us to all sit here now and say, oh yeah, we, we knew that. Well, maybe so, but we know it now because it's been pointed out yeah. that we, because we don't consciously think of that like the bread thing. So, some of you may know uh, Brooke Stover, who models the Buffalo Creek and Gauley in S scale. And Brooks is to the B, C, and G, what Gary Kohler is to the S, R, and R, L. Uh, Brooks has waybills for like a, sh a shipment of coal showing 
when they picked it up at the mine, took it down to the interchange, switched the car into whatever the, 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 the mainline railroad was to take it to Chicago. And then he has the, uh, the bill of receipt that the power plant or the industrial consigner in Chicago actually received the uh, shipment of coal. And a lot of this is handwritten in beautiful script like we don't see anymore. And then some lucky secretary got to type all of this in every <laughs> night. Uh, so for the record books as well, it's just, it's pretty amazing to see the amount of, uh, of work and documentation because this was money. You know, this is how they were getting paid. That's all. Thank you, Gary. No, no, that's, I mean, that's, no, that is important. And it's, you know, again, it's, it's we don't have this tendency to look at these things and, and which is fine. You know, if I, you know. Gary, oh, to oh, move, move briefly back to uh, the minutia, Adam, um, the Plymouth, the uh, Portsmouth bread baking is just astonishing, I think. Do do any of you guys have or have had uh, in the past access to local newspapers? Because I note that all of the little towns had a little local newspaper uh, with local news in it. Have we got anything about a local baker? The idea of having to ship a trainload of bread in that context amazes me. I would have thought some bright spark would have said, look, why don't I ship grain and millet and bake it into bread and cream off some of the profit uh, rather than leave that to some big baker in Portland? Well, I, I can't, I can't say for sure because I don't have that sitting in front of me, but I have to believe that somebody was baking a loaf of bread somewhere. Well, wasn't yeah. mm. so, uh, in, in one of the new videos put out by the WWF Railway, there's a scene of, of Rangeley Station after that part of the line was closed down and there were some oxen or whatever crossing in front of it. And don't they say that that was now like a, a bakery? Yes. So by the mid to late 30s, or actually mid 30s, there was a bakery right there in Rangeley in the old station building. Well, going, you know, through these, um, and I, I only, you know, presented a handful of them, but, you know, there was, you know, flour and, you know, different types of grain, meal uh, was another thing that's, you know, came up, you know, so this stuff was going someplace and, you know, the winter store wasn't, you know, just the only source of, you know, quote unquote flour along the railroad. In fact, they were serving Kingfield. They weren't serving Rangeley. I'm pretty sure that Rangeley probably had some means of getting a loaf of bread baked. But as far as on a commercial level, I don't know. And they may have had the Rangeley Lake House may have been big enough to, you know, that they did their own. And you know, there's certainly that possibility. But I, well, we, well, you also may have a bunch of people coming from Portland who say, I want my local bread. <laughs> well, right. I mean, with the high rollers that were go going there. Yeah. There's uh, does anybody, you guys all know who the Gwyden family is? Who? Glidden? Yes. The paint? Paint, yeah. Yeah. You're going to talk about the Glidden automobile tours, aren't you? Yeah. Uh huh. So, you know, that's that stuff's all very possible, and uh, you know, why not? Just one thing to add, you know, Barney did his book on industries and freight operations it does have a lot of stats in it and those stats are come off of documents that he has so he has a document on tonnage 
for the year 1916. He doesn't show the actual document. I think he copied it so that it would be more palatable and readable wow. there. But he calls it a form F-19 of the main central railroad for the Sandy River and Rangeley Lakes for the year ending December 31st, 1961. So it's got all the tonnage, um, you know, and it lists grain, flour, all those things. Sugar's in there, so that's 78 tons of sugar were shipped on the railroad. About 452 tons of cement were shipped in 1916. So somebody was laying down some pave pavement or doing some sort of uh, um, foundations or something with that cement. Um, he talks about railroad ties and all the lumber and bark being shipped, 38 tons of bark, not a ton, but I didn't know bark was even shipped out. Typically bark goes to a tannery. Didn't know there was one around. There is some mention of hides. Um, milk and cream is 24 tons. That's not very much, maybe, I don't know. Livestock, 144 tons of livestock. Yes. So not insignificant. Um, paper, lime, acids, merchandise, ice, you know, all kinds of things are listed here. He's got 44 items listed for a total of 124,000 tons. Now, Ships most, most of that's inbound. Oh, well, those are the things I'm reading. He, he's got 8,000 you know, of lumber and 74,000 is pulp wood. So most of that would be out. Right. And that's, that's, that's almost 50%. That's over 50% of the tonnage is pulp wood. In 1916, which shows how much the railroad has transitioned away from lumber at that point and transitioned to hauling pulp wood by 1916, you know, if you probably if you could get these numbers for 1908 or 1906, you would see that it's more lumber and less pulp wood. Oh yeah, it would be way more sawn lumber. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. But it gives you an idea for a year. I used some of these numbers once to try to calculate well, how many railroad cars, you know, of pulp wood went down to Farmington, how many is that a day? You know, you can start to use these to sort of make estimates. You know, if you want to run and then you figure three cars to a main central box car and you know 124 even if it was you know a hundred thousand was outbound you can figure out how many freight cars are headed out roughly in the year on the main central and see you know <laughs> they're not hauling much you know the sandy river and rangery lakes is running several trains a day with freight in them with the extras right so let's call it three trains a day down but the the main central is calling a 10 car 12 car train out a day, maybe at most of freight. So interesting numbers to consider. And those, I, I'm just going by my memory. It might've been a little more of that than that, but it's. Well, whatever they were hauling out of there, it was obviously enough. Yeah. To keep them happy business-wise. And, and, and 1916 wasn't even their peak year. Right. But I think the neat thing is, is that from a modeler and why the Sandy River and Ranger Lakes has kept my interest is the operations and the comparison that in a small space, you run many multiple trains. And if you were modeling this in standard gauge, you'd have just a few boxcars going out a day, right? You can count them on two hands, maybe three hands. But when you start talking about Sandy River cars, you're now up to 40 to 45 cars moving a day down towards Farmington, that's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot of move, movement. And that lasts up into the 20s. And, you know, Gary's probably gonna argue and it, and it might be rightfully so. You look at some of that conductor book from 1920 and it's, and probably some of the numbers he has from 28 or something or later, you know, it's still 20 cars going down to Farmington or more. There's two two trains, two extras. You look at the conductor's book. 
Yes, there it's a multiplier because it's narrow gauge in smaller cars, so right. it's a busier road. I'm sure manpower gets starts to get more and more expensive for them on the transfer though. Well, I think that's part of the reason that they they ended up settling on this so-called 15 car limit i mean they had three or four five six locomotives that could easily handle 15 cars without you know barely breaking a sweat which you know kind of like what do we need number 23 for but so what's this they had a 15 car limit yeah they kind of settled on this 15 car train thing when did they do that somewhere in the teens yeah there's there's very little evidence of them hauling trains much bigger than 15 cars in fact i think there's only one example in that conductor's book though so, and if you think about what you know like dave was just saying if you bring a 20 plus car train into farmington yard what exactly is you're going to do with it you're stuck. <laughs> you're, you're not. You can't do anything. You're clogged. The yard can't handle much more. I mean, yeah, because you already got at least one or two other trains of you know either a train being unloaded, empties, blah 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 blah, and now you're going to bring another train in there that doesn't even fit. So, yeah, they they you need to have an empty run, uh, an empty passing track to get into. So that you can then maneuver the rest of the cars and get them back out. Correct. So it was many trains, shorter trains, so they could funnel this stuff in and out of there faster. Yep. Instead of trying to bring one, just one gargantuous train in there. And there's, again, if there's proof of that, I haven't seen it. I mean, I, I think I've got that noted in there yeah, it's not to say that it didn't happen occasionally but you couldn't just keep having many 20 plus car trains coming in the other thing is is there's not enough box cars the main central can't line up space for you to align a box car next to each one of those cars to take it out it, you start to get to a point of being too full The longest train noted in the conductor's book was locomotive 19 with 21 cars. That was in 1920. And I don't know where it was going. That might not even go to Farmington. They may have been you know, switching on the P and R or something. But there's they certainly didn't need you know, locomotives the size of number 23 to, I don't care whether there was 20 cars. Yeah. Locomotive 19 could handle that. And certainly, you know, 15 and, and 24 could easily handle that, that kind of load. So, you know, I mean, what do we need this gigantic locomotive for? Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the story is, is that they brought trains into Phillips and then they collected the cars and headed to Farmington and they probably picked some up in Strong or occasionally some trains ran all the way down from Kingfield. But. Well, in the, which I, if I could find them, I would show them to you, the uh, engine house assignments and locomotives that were actually, you know, being used or operated out of. <laughs> um, Rangeley, Kingfield and, and Phillips. And I don't think in any of the ones that I have, there was ever more than two shown being operated out of Rangeley, two out of Kingfield and five out of Phillips. So by my math, that's only nine locomotives. 
being operated on any given day. And that was, I think, through the peak years, late teens, early 20s. Much again, you'd have to go. You, if you could find more train orders, station registers, the timetables aren't going to help you. So you need this other material that I don't, I don't know that it exists. And but you'd need a lot more of that, I think, to put that narrative together. So I mean, I <laughs> that doesn't seem unlikely i mean at first i'm surprised that there's only two engines coming out of kingfield but it was interesting to read davos's latest book and see the pictures where the engine house in bigelow is gone and um so they must have they didn't they didn't need it or they didn't rebuild it i wonder if it got washed away or was so close to the river that it was a pain to maintain but um So they would have only had the engine house in Kingfield. They didn't really use the engine house in Strong, right? Well, that was torn down in early 20s. Yeah. But that means that then there's only two engines running the whole line. Well, unless they brought them over from Phillips sometimes on a given day. run the Kingfield line. It's hard to believe only two engines running that line with the branches. But they they you ran engines all night. And they just ran the same engine maybe. Who knows? Well I guess we, you don't know that we we don't know that because we don't have that information. Right. I mean I'm not sitting here trying to tell anybody it doesn't exist. I've never seen it. I mean I've and I'm not holding any secrets. I showed you what I got. I mean, as far as like the train orders, that sort of stuff, I mean, whatever, that's it. I've never seen another one of those. There's another one out there, great, but I haven't seen it. And I'd like to see about, you know, another dozen of those. Like, same with these conductor books. They probably did exist. I'm sure they did. I, mean, I, I got that from Elliot uh, Stewart. In uh, <laughs> he was a character. Anyways, when when they were cleaning out the engine house, he'd go down. He'd go down because they were taking all this stuff to the to the turntable pit and burning it. So he'd take his wheelbarrow down there and load it up and take it home. And after a couple of days of this, the old man says, "What What are you doing? No." You, you take that crap back. We don't need all that stuff. So the old man made him, you know, take most of it back. Now, thank God he did keep, he did keep a bunch of it. And but God knows what went back into the. And he said the burn part. You know that went for days, days. But they were burns. Right. So some of this stuff, you know, we're never going to see ever. And you know, we're going to have to get the speculation like like this you know like what could they have done with what little bits of information that we do have and but as you know as far as the you know the locomotive assignment thing um we're assuming that none of those five locomotives from phillips didn't go to kingfield or Raymond. yeah i think that's a question <laughs> Did some of them go from Phillips over to Kingfield? Probably. Yeah, on a given day. Because if a train was, depending on the schedule, if a train was supposed to start in strong, if it's running deadhead anyway, is it going to run deadhead from Kingfield down? You know, Mark Harris did that nice article for you about 1913 or 12 and how the consists were done. That was in the main two-foot quarterly, I believe. Um, and if you look at things, his hypothesis is that the first train had the deadhead for the first passenger train, you deadhead down to Farmington in the morning. That's why I made that comment when you say that first extra, that might be deadheading down to Farmington to run his number three coming back up. Um, it makes sense that, you know, if 
the first passenger on the Kingfield line was going to start in strong, it could just dead head down from Phillips rather than dead head down from Kingfield. It would have been an easier ride and depending on where the crews were and the engines, it was easier to maintain the engines in Phillips. Then why not? But I haven't checked all that out. I've always assumed Kingfield, but with the, the engine house gone at Bigelow and what you're suggesting, there may not have been that many engines sitting in Kingfield or not fired up. Well, again, that goes to that. What, how, how was the, what were the train movements out of Phillips? I mean, obviously that's their hub. That's where most of the action is going to be. And we don't, we don't know that. That's one of those things. That we don't know where all the extras move. You, you only know where the, the scheduled trains moved, which you can see in the 1912 or 16 or 19 timetables that are published various places. You can see some of those, but. Um, where the extras go and what goes up the Eustis branch at what time and how many engines did you need to handle that at the same time? But it was not in service all that long, all the time, or you know, the Barnjum or the Madrid branches. You know, when did they go up and down that? You know, was there a, a single extra that went out and worked the whole railroad wandering branches? Don't know. That's that, that's all part of the until you Fun. stumble on that. A piece of paper that that shows that you kind of have to speculate some of that, unfortunately. Um, yeah, but I, you know, it's I think the train order uh, thing, you know, certainly outlines the the extras and how that stuff was handled and that they did, you know, run these low quote unquote locals. You know, not everything was just, you know, drag freight down to down to Farmington. You know, there were other things going on. And but that's again, those are the things that we don't and haven't seen, you know, that I think you know keeps making this railroad exciting. So anyway. Gary, I've just been called to lunch. So may I thank you again. Keith, uh, David, uh, thanks very much for minding uh, uh, all of this stuff and for the invitation again uh, i do appreciate all of that so um, i'll wish you a good evening and a good sleep for all of you northern hemisphere people yes my voice about ready to give out so yes it is isn't it <laughs> yeah so thanks everybody appreciate it Hopefully thanks gavin have a nice evening <laughs> lunch midday Anyways, all right. I'm out of here, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thanks. Gary. Right, thanks.